you do. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, hello and uh, welcome, One Young World delegates, to this session. My name is Ahmed Nawaz, and I will be moderating today's discussion uh, titled Maintaining Peace, the Path Forward Amidst Global Instability. So uh, just to firstly briefly introduce myself, uh, my name is Ahmed Nawaz. I am a survivor of a terrorist attack that took place in Pakistan in 2014, December. Uh, in that attack, I lost my brother. I was, myself was shot in that attack. Uh, and many of my friends were killed in that attack. In the aftermath, fast forward, I was brought uh, to the UK for treatment, uh, after which I started uh, a campaign uh, to focus on education in order to get rid of extremism and to eradicate radicalization. Uh, so that's what I've been focused on. We've worked, I've worked on uh, the refugee crisis by providing education to refugees. Um, uh, we built a school in Lebanon for the refugee camps where 300 children are studying. And <clears throat> yeah, at the moment I'm just studying, uh, going into my third year at Oxford. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, and I joined here uh, in One Young World in 2019 in London. Uh, it was a fantastic electric atmosphere and I I'm really glad to be here again. Um, and today, particularly, I am thrilled and honored uh, to be joined by Michael Moller, uh, One Young World Counselor and former Director General of the United Nations uh, Office in Geneva. Uh, Michael Moller, I had a very interesting conversation with just before this session um, and gotten to know him a lot more. Michael has worked for more than 40 years uh, in the United Nations, uh, has gone to many countries and speaks seven languages, I believe, uh, which is quite impressive. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I just wanted to get into our conversation on uh, maintaining peace, um, the path forward amidst global instability. And the first thing, uh, the first question that I wanted to ask was more from Michael uh, to sort of explicate the title, uh, maintaining peace. What goes into uh, what, uh, maintaining peace in today's modern world? And what things, well, how would you define peace? Because you mentioned earlier in our discussion that it, it's not merely the absence of war, it's many other things. Thank you, Ahmed. Yeah, let's, I think it's, uh, it's good to just put a good framework around our discussion in the next 20 minutes. And there's a couple of things I want to remind you of. As he just said, um, peace is mo much more than the absence of war. And particularly in these times, in these very difficult times for our planet, um, if we want to make peace, we need to be uh, aware and work on a whole series of issues um, that make the foundation for a peaceful society. It's inequalities, it's water, it's climate, it's uh, migration, it's uh, pretty much every uh, uh, human indicator you care to look at, um, education, gender, children, um, that needs to uh, be paid attention to and worked on in order to create the foundation for real peace. Um, and the other thing I like to remind people of is that we actually know how to do it. Um, after the Second World War, the world gave itself a, an international system that has done absolutely extraordinary work for humanity over the past 80 years. Um, the, the, the international system with the UN and all its partners at its heart have given humanity a level of peace and rights and well-being that it has never ever had before in its history. The consequence of that is that we know what needs to be done. We know what the problems are. We have quite a good grip on what the solutions are. We have the human capital and the knowledge and the expertise. We even have the funds to do with most of what needs to be done. What we don't have is the will, or the sufficient will. And when I say we, it's all of us. It's not just the politicians. I mean, for many years when we talked about will, we talked about the lack of political will. That's no longer just the case. And then a third thing is the fact that um, our, the systems that gave us this well-being and this peace um, are no longer up to the task. The existential problems that we're faced with are so huge and so vast, and the systems that we built have not kept pace with the demands of these, uh, these, these big uh, challenges. On top of that, we have a, a serious structural problem that we have to deal with which is that our political systems are short-term. People get elected for three, maximum four years, when they get elected at all. 
Um, and the, the solutions that we need to apply to these big problems that we have, whether it's climate, whether it's water, whether it's food insecurity, whether it's inequality, social and economic, etc., are long-term, require long-term solutions. And the gap between um, the short-term political systems with politicians who uh, have not, neither the ability or the wish to take decisions that have an impact 10 or 15 years down the road, um, that gap is growing. Um, and just to start off on the right to note, the bridge of that gap is you. In the future, you are going to have to be the ones that, uh, that, that make that bridge with the help of, uh, of those who uh, are the repositories of a lot of the expertise that needs to be put to play. Yeah. So that yeah. sets a frame a little no, bit for what uh, we That's are. an excellent point. When you mentioned earlier that the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, yes. essentially provide uh, a framework for how to attain peace. Um, that uh, I, it really sort of resonated with me because I think if we, uh, the young people all present here today uh, at the One Young World Conference in general, uh, if these people are focusing on these particular SDGs, each one of them have, a lot of them have very diverse interests. Uh, I think that it could be a huge step towards it. But another point that resonated from that was the, uh, the gap between the governments who are short term, they don't really care that much about the long term sort of uh, things like the climate change, uh, perhaps. It's one of those things that we have to sort of work towards uh, over the long run. And I think, um, as you mentioned earlier in the conversation as well, that young people, when they step up, they're the constant. Uh, the, governments won't, the governments won't stay that long, these leaders. Uh, but it is us uh, all over here. Let me just uh, add to that. We are in a governance transition and have been for quite a few years um, and it is speeding up at all levels of society, international, regional, uh, national, uh, local, communal, um, where the governments and the government structures as we've known them for several hundred years will no, are in some cases and will in many cases no longer be the only actors uh, around the decision making table. Other actors are going to step up and are stepping up. Um, it's civil society, it's a business community, it's you, the youth, it's uh, uh, academics, etc. Um, and, uh, and in terms of governance and in terms of uh, where you find the good politicians, one of the areas where you will find um, people who actually take action and who are closer to the citizen, closer to you, are the mayors of cities. We are already over 50% of the world population lives in cities. By 2075, if, if not before, we're going to be closer to 80% of the world population living in cities. This is where the stuff is happening, where the rubber hits the road. And those people are much more innovative, are much more flexible, and are much more, as I said, closer to the citizen and are able to deliver the, the, the things that uh, you need in your daily life um, in terms of health, in terms of education, in terms of water, in terms of the services. Um, so the, the governance of our planet and the, the governance uh, at all levels, as I said, is changing quite rapidly. And this is your chance and your entry point uh, for being part of that change and being part of that governance structure. And we can talk a little bit about that uh, in more in depth uh, yeah. when we get down to that. No, abs absolutely. Um, one stat uh, that I wanted to talk about was that the Global Peace Index 2022 found that global peacefulness continues to deteriorate. Why do you think uh, establishing multilateral approaches uh, to international relations and policy is so critical to achieving global peace? Because without it, we won't achieve it. To be a very simple answer. Um, the multilateral system, as I mentioned in a different way, no longer works as it should. So we have to reinvent it. We have to obviously do it in such a way that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and we retain the, what, all the good stuff that, that, that made this last 80 years so successful. But the fact is that we need to come up with a system, and we are coming up with a system, and it ties to what I just said about governance, that is much more integrated, much more collaborative, much more networked, much more de-siloed. We can no longer afford to sit in each our silos and do our own thing without uh, interacting and connecting the dots, and much more preventive. And um, this is happening. I'm not sure it's happening fast enough because uh, developments uh, in all of these massive existential threats uh, in front of us, but not only there, also in the development of new technologies is coming so quickly at us um, that we are going to have a very hard, we, all of us, uh, individually and uh, collectively, are going to have 
uh, and are having a very hard time adapting fast enough. Yeah. So that's another area that we need to talk no, about. I think, yes, exactly. So you mentioned the uh, role of technology, the impact of technology. Um, uh, it has also, uh, as you mentioned, like contributed to the increase in inequality uh, around the world. Uh, what, what do you think is the way to sort of overcome the inequality caused by technology or things that are, uh, in fact, good for sort of multilateralism and for tackling these issues? A lot of the technologies that are being worked on today are being worked on in the private sector. And uh, there is very little ethical considerations built into how that is done. There is very little governance, good governance, about how it's de developed and how it's going to be uh, uh, provided to the, to the market. And there is very little consideration to equity. In other words, no consideration or very little to access. It's crucially important as we move forward and as, uh, as technology becomes more and more an, uh, an element in our daily lives that um, these new technologies are accessible to everyone on the planet, not just people in the north and those who have money and those who have uh, in, invented it. So those, those are things that need to be, this is kind of stuff I, I work on right now uh, to make sure that these things happen as we develop and as we ensure that uh, uh, the technologies that are coming at us are going to be used for the good of humanity and not for um, uh, the opposite. It's incredibly hard to uh, apply governance and rules and regulations on technologies that are already out in the market. So we have to be in a hurry. We have to really be uh, preventive. We have to be ahead of the game um, in order to put some rules into how these technologies are going to be developed and disseminated. Um, i give you a couple of examples. Um, one is autonomous weapons that there is zero control over. These are weapons that kill people without any human interaction or, or, or once the, the, the uh, algorithms have been written. Um, and um, something more close to home, if you look at the way social media has evolved, um, with absolutely zero control, zero rules uh, of the game, zero laws, and um, are going a little haywire and frankly in many societies are uh, inflicting quite a lot of harm on our young people. Um, and we need to get a grip. Uh, in fact, to put it in shorthand, we need to be in charge of our own future and not let the future be in charge of us. Yeah, that, that sounds fantastic. Um, the one thing, so I wanted to bring us more into a sort of more, uh, like uh, a, a more sort of recent discussion, uh, especially to do with the invasion of Ukraine. So with the invasion of Ukraine in February of this year, uh, it, it sparked a lot of conversation around the existing global order. Uh, you talked earlier about the uh, international system that was created post-World War uh, to avoid such things as well. Uh, what impact has this conflict specifically had on global governance and multilateralism? Um, and how do you think that international agreements and institutions help bring about an end to the Ukraine or such conflicts? It's a difficult question right now because we're in the middle of it. But clearly, when you have a permanent member of the Security Council that goes to war uh, on a neighbor with absolutely no but strong reason apart from um, their own, you have a serious problem because this is a blatant attack on the very fundamental rules that have governed the way that we manage our planet over the past 80 years. And so, of course, it does something to multilateralism. And it comes back to what I was saying before, the multilateralism as we know it is no longer capable of, 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 uh, of doing what it's supposed to be doing. And when you are in a, in a situation sort of between two chairs where you're moving from one system into another, stuff happens and very often negative stuff happens and we're certainly seeing it now. How this is going to play out is hard to say. Um, um, you know, um, I, I hope that we're not going to end up in a really bad situation where nuclear weapons are going to be used, whether tactical or not. Um, it's a possibility that uh, clearly we have to deal with. Um, we are now in a situation where the, uh, the issue of uh, energy is, going, is, is being used, is being weaponized, and where all of us are going to suffer, even people who have absolutely no, no, no connection, if you want, to that war. Um, one of the interesting things in this particular war and the way that it's playing out is that when you look at the response across the globe, when you talk to people from Africa, you talk to people from Asia and Latin America, they don't consider this their war. This is a European little regional war, and we better get to grips with it. Yeah. Notwithstanding the fact that the grain issue is affecting a number of people in terms of their food accessibility, etc. Um, but there is a, there's a change in the way that many countries are um, 
are, are kind of positioning themselves in what used to be a fairly homogeneous international agreement on how we need to deal with peace and security issues. When you look at the voting pattern in the General Assembly, uh, when um, um, sanctions were imposed on Russia, 59 countries voted no. You know, that's uh, close to a third of all countries on the planet. So there's a change, and that is part of this change I was talking about before, on where we're moving towards a different kind of multilateralism. And we'll get there eventually, because there is absolutely no way that we are going to survive unless we work together. It doesn't matter which problem you want to look at. If we don't figure out a way of working much, much better together than we've ever done before and, collabor and, and collaborate, we are not going to be able to lick these massive problems that are in front of us. Yeah. So my, I don't want to completely depress you, but um, um, my sort of place where I go and find some, some, some measure of optimism is the fact that we as humans have an incredibly strong survival gene. It usually kicks in when the knife is at our throat. That knife is pretty close to the throat, and we will find ways out of these problems, um, I'm pretty sure, because it's a matter of life and death to us yeah. as, a, as a human race. Yeah. But just to further, um, I, in terms of the, uh, the, exam the thing that you talked about, the voting in the General Assembly where 59 countries voted no, um, I, just to play devil's advocate here, I think, like, uh, of course, I really believe that no one should be condoning such thing. But do you not think that uh, in this time, uh, there, there should be, there are factors that are, that they're perhaps sort of, uh, you know, forced into almost doing that because there is, you know, they, they, like, let's say a country needs uh, the supply of oil or the supply of some uh, goods that no other countries would provide to them. Uh, on a, this is more on a technical side. Uh, they look to Russia, for instance, to provide them with that. And if multi uh, multilateralism isn't happening from the countries that are opposing it to support these countries, uh, I think it, at times these countries turn to that. Yeah. So how would you respond? No, no, but you don't make me wrong. My comment wasn't a criticism. Okay. It was just a statement of fact. Okay. And you're right. You're perfectly right. I mean, of course, uh, the, the, you have a problem here. All of these countries are looking out for their own interests. Yeah. We are now in a situation in the world where we can no longer just look out for our own interests. So there needs to be a much greater uh, cohabitation, if you want, with the common good and our own interests and, and not sort of just be. Look at the way that um, we dealt with COVID globally. I mean, the scientific community got together and produced vaccines in less than a year. It has never been seen before. However, the member states and all the international community really messed up and did not manage to figure out a way of sharing vaccines um, and of making sure that those who didn't have access and didn't have, couldn't afford to get them got it. So you had countries like Canada, for example. I have nothing against Canada. But Canada bought five times more vaccines than they needed for their whole population. Um, I don't think that's an ethical way of going about things. Certainly not. And that the, 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 yeah. the, the business of collaboration is a fundamental principle that we need to in incorporate into our policies and interactions if we want to survive. Yeah. So, sort of lastly, uh, we're coming to the end of the session. Um, I think this is more sort of like a next steps and sort of an action sort of a question. Um, so in this age of uh, where multilateralism itself is criticized and uh, there are changes that needs to be made, uh, what can the young people here, uh, what steps can they take to sort of, you know, promote this global sort of thinking uh, mm. in general and um, work towards this themselves? I think it's absolutely crucial that you do. Inform yourselves, be active, be activists. Um, I, one of the things that we're doing, I'm doing in, 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 in my daily life, is also to foster intergenerational dialogues between young people and the older people not to be told on how to do things, but more importantly, to be told on how not to do things and to learn from the mistakes of the past. And many mistakes have been made, frankly, and are still being made. So that's one aspect of your, uh, your self-education, if you want, to make sure that uh, you understand what's at stake and to see where each one of you, in small or big ways, depending on what you're doing, um, that, you, uh, that you're able to, uh, to, 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 to be part of, of the action. I mean, frankly, One Young World is one of these places where you do exactly that, where you're inspired, where you learn, where you have extraordinary amount of young people who are uh, innovative, outside of the box thinkers, 
were coming up solutions to all sorts of really huge problems. Um, I've been listening, and I've, this is not my first time, and I'm also always in awe of what you guys come up with. That has to be leveraged, and that has to be, and the dots have to be connected, um, and, and you have to work together, and you have to be part of, uh, of that governance change. You have to force your way onto the table, both the policy uh, setting table and the decision making table. You have a right to be there, and you have a, you have a responsibility to be there, because frankly, you are inheriting a massive mess and you better be ready to deal with it. And it's just in a few years before you are in, in, uh, in position, uh, each one of you, to, to, be, to be able to do something about it. Yeah. Um, so education, listen, talk between each other, connect dots between you across uh, different parts of the world, uh, speak to your elders uh, to see what uh, kind of advice they can give you. Um, and now, a fantastic point, because the last few days uh, that I've been at this conference, I've met people from a very wide range of sort of uh, interests uh, in what things they want to work on, uh, um, from climate to the refugee crisis to the uh, sort of biodiversity, sort of like the oceans, etc., like focusing on a lot of different things. Um, and I think communicating amongst yourselves and speaking to these other people um, because all of these things, as we established at the beginning of the session, contribute to the, towards the global peace. Uh, if any of these things are missing, we've yet, we still haven't attained peace yet globally. Um, so yeah, I think, um, uh, thank you very much again for such an incredible uh, conversation. It's, In terms of learning, let me just, uh, just yeah. because I'm here and because that's what I'm doing, I'm right now working for, uh, for a uh, foundation that looks into the technologies of tomorrow over the, the technologies that are coming at us over the next 25 years. If you go and look at the website, gesda.global, you will be able to see a little bit what's coming at you. I recommend that you don't read it before you fall asleep. Um, it's uh, incredibly exciting, but it's also deeply scary what's coming in our way. So happy reading. G-E-S-D-A, G-E-S-D-A dot global. Yeah. And look particularly at the one document that's in there that's called the scientific, the science radar breakthrough that tells you, written by scientists themselves, on what is going to happen in quantum, in artificial intelligence, in human augmentation, in geoengineering, and in science and diplomacy. Those are the five, the four um, platforms that we're working on. Okay. Um, it'll give you an insight in, uh, in the kind of science and technologies that are coming at us, and also help you uh, think about how you're going to adapt and how you're communities are going to adapt to them because they're going to be deeply, deeply transformative. Yeah. Much more than any of you in this room can even imagine. Yeah, no, that's, uh, it was super exciting. We spoke about it before the, uh, the session began. Um, and I want to thank Michael again for joining me in this conversation. I uh, just wanted to say one last thing before uh, we end this. Um, as we are all uh, people from very sort of diverse interests uh, in things that we want to change in this world, uh, we must all, regardless of what we're interested in, uh, when there are issues happening at hand, uh, the more recent issues like the Ukraine conflict uh, is happening, I think we should all, regardless of whatever we're doing, uh, should be uh, supporting these things or talking about these things because that is our job as change makers and activists and advocates. Uh, there is a huge crisis in Pakistan. The, the flooding is happening there, where which is caused by the global ca climate crisis, which is a big issue that we're discussing here at One Young World. So I think when things like these are happening, advocates like yourselves, activists like yourselves, and us all, essentially, uh, we mustn't stay quiet. Um, and it is always time to speak up and raise awareness or take action on these things. But yeah, thank you very much, Michael. I'm very grateful for this thank discussion. You. Thank you. Thank you.